and go over how you can have $100,000 in annual tax-free income during retirement. And this article is written by CNBC from a person called Sarah O'Brien. So let's get into this uh, article. So it's a sure bet that no one, regardless of age, enjoys handing over any of their income to the IRS. In retirement, though, doing so can feel like even more of a sting. Assuming you've left work earnings entirely behind you, any amount owed to Uncle Sam comes from your retirement income and savings, both of which also are expected to fund your golden years for oh, another two or even three decades. The good news is that there are strategies to reduce what you end up paying in federal and perhaps state taxes, which of course translates into more money staying with you. But getting there can involve some work. To generate on a regular basis tax-free income over a long period of time, you have to put a lot of planning in place, said certified financial planner Avani Ramnani, director of financial planning and wealth management at Francis Financial in New York. For perspective, if you want your retirement savings to generate $100,000 a year in tax-free retirement income, and you want to adhere to the 4% per year withdrawal rule, in general, a rate that would make your money last for at least 30 years, you'd need at least a $2.5 million portfolio. Of course, your own annual cash flow needs may be higher or lower than $100,000, and you may need to employ a combination of strategies depending on the particulars of your situation. So a Roth account. If you can save money in a Roth version of an individual retirement account or 401k plan, you can set yourself up for a pretty straightforward way to get tax-free income. While your contributions are not tax-deductible as they may be with a traditional IRA or 401k, distributions made after age 59 and a half are generally tax-free. Now, the best way to end up with tax-free income is to pay the taxes first, and the best way to do that is to contribute to a Roth account throughout your working years, said CFP George Galliardi, founder of Corolla Mandel Wealth Management in Lexington, Massachusetts. So the maximum you can contribute to a year in a year to a Roth IRA is $6,000, but $7,000 if you're age 50 or older. However, that amount starts phasing out at income of $125,000 for a single taxpayer and $198,000 for married couples filing a joint tax return and disappears at income of $140,000 for singles and $208,000 for couples. So Roth 401k accounts are more generous. There's no income cap and you can contribute up to $19,500 in 2021 plus another $6,500 if you're age 50 or older. Now, there are ways to get around the Roth IRA income cap. For instance, you could contribute to a traditional IRA and then convert the money to a Roth, and there could be taxes owed on the conversion, but you would pay no tax on distributions down the road. Health Savings Account If you have access to a health savings account, which can only be paired with a high-deductible health plan, it can be used as a way to plan for some tax-free income in retirement. Unlike with a similarly named health flexible spending account, you don't have to spend HSA money within a certain time frame. HSA contributions are tax deductible, gains in the account grow tax free, and withdrawals used to pay for qualified medical expenses are also tax free and penalty free. And at age 65, withdrawals can go toward anything without paying a penalty, although if the money is used for non medical expenses, it would be subject to tax. You can also contribute $3,600 to an HSA in 2021, 7200 for family coverage. And if you're age 55 or older, you can put in an extra $1,000. And then there's municipal bonds. These bonds are issued by states, counties, cities, and the like to fund public projects. And the interest you earn on so-called munis is generally not subject to federal tax. So if the bond is issued in your state of residence, it also may be tax-free at the state level as well. However, if you buy money for a state you don't live in, you'd have to pay state income tax for those, said Ramani, Ramnani at Francis Financial.
So, for example, if you live in New York and you buy bonds issued in California, you still have to pay state income tax on them. Ramnani said, "There also may be certain instances in which munis are subject to federal taxation, so it's important to know before assuming your earnings are tax-free." And then you could capitalize on long-term capital gains rates. Any gain on any investment held for more than a year is considered long-term, and is generally taxed as such. Otherwise, it's taxed as ordinary income. The same goes for qualified dividends. For long-term gains, the tax rate depends on your income. And if you are a single tax filer with up to forty thousand dollars in income, eighty thousand dollars for married couples filing jointly, the rate is zero percent. So if you can keep your income below those thresholds, those gains can be tax-free income. Keep in mind, though, that taxes are just one consideration when it comes to any investment strategies in retirement. Now you also have to think about portfolio allocation. Ramnani said. Are you allocated in a way that is well diversified and in line with your risk tolerance and goals? There can be competing objectives or considerations, and then there's life insurance or annuities. While permanent life insurance policies generally come with much higher premiums than term life insurance, part of the reason for that is the savings aspect of these policies. Now, the idea is that you pay those high premiums, and some of it goes to the insurance piece, and the other part goes into a saving and investment bucket. And depending on the specifics, these so-called cash value life insurance policies can be used to produce retirement income that is not subject to taxes. So, CFP Michael Resnick, Senior Wealth Management Advisor for GCG Financial in Deerfield, Illinois. Now, our view on life insurance is that typically ter- term life insurance would usually be the better choice, just because it's very expensive for whole life compared to term life. Right, especially for what kind of money you're actually getting, and I believe in the first three to five years, depending on the terms of the whole life, the three to five years amounts that you're paying into it, I believe, only go straight into the insurance company's pockets, which is pretty disturbing. But there is some additional complexity with when distributing, so care should be taken. Says similarly, in annuities can provide an income stream in retirement. If you use after-tax money to fund one, just the interest is taxable, generally speaking. However, there are many different types of annuities, and they can be more expensive than other income stream options. And once you give your money to the insurance company that sold you the annuity, it can be hard to give it back, get it back after a short. Review period. So, depending on the contract, you could pay what's called a surrender charge if you no longer want the annuity or withdraw more from it than allowed. That fee can be pretty steep, especially in the early years of the contract. Now, what about Social Security? Depending on how much you receive from Social Security and your other income, your benefits may be subject to tax. Yet, you may still be able to owe little to nothing to Uncle Sam. The calculation basically involves adding one half of your benefits to your adjusted gross income, as well as non-taxable interest, i.e., muni bonds. If that amount is twenty-five thousand dollars to thirty-four thousand dollars for a single tax filer, thirty-two thousand to forty-four thousand dollars for married couples filing jointly, then fifty percent is taxable. Below that range of income, it's not taxed, and if it's above those amounts, eighty-five percent is taxable. However, even if the calculation results in an amount that is subject to tax, you'd still get to subtract the standard deduction, twelve thousand five hundred fifty for singles, twenty-five thousand one hundred for married couples in twenty twenty-one, and from that, and if you're at least age sixty-five, you get a bigger standard deduction, an extra seventeen hundred dollars for single filers, and thirteen fifty per person for married couples. In other words, your deduction or deductions may bring your actual tax burden down to zero or close to it. If you do have income that's taxed and other stuff, there are of course other sources of income that could come your way in retirement and not be subject to taxes. For instance, if you get divorced, alimony, spousal support is not taxable to the recipient if the divorce occurred after 2018. Also, if you receive a gift from, say, your parents, it is not taxable to you. Same goes for life insurance proceeds if you are the beneficiary on the policy. And any gain on the sale of your primary home generally comes with an exclusion. Up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars is exempt if you are a single tax filer, and five hundred thousand dollars for married couples filing jointly. So feel free to give your thoughts on this situation. If you want to learn how to master your money, go down below and learn how to master your money in a very simple and easy to follow path. But yeah, this was a pretty good article. I agree with a lot of it. A lot of people would agree with a lot of it. CMB is pretty good at what they do, and we'll see you in future episodes. Stay tuned for more 
financial-related content. 